David, thank you so much for for jumping on. Uh, uh the audience obviously doesn't know, but our history goes back quite some some years uh where we started right. through like a Francis Ford Coppola website he had. I don't even know if it's still active. Is that it? Yeah, the, the Zoetrope, American Zoetrope where like sure, filmmakers sure. could sort of it was like a filmmaker community, online yeah, community. Yeah. Wow. And we would read each other's scripts. Uh and and Amazing. that's sort of how we, you know, became digital friends. Uh and and over the years, you know, our degenerate addiction to movies and, and making them <laughs> has sort of kept us going. Yeah. Uh sure. and you wrote a book. you you teach screenwriting at Drexel yeah. University, right? Mm -hmm. Uh and you wrote a book, screenwriting for micro budget films, right. uh, which I think is incredible. Uh, because oh, you know, a lot of people go into filmmaking or, or want to be filmmakers, but the path to sort of Hollywood, I, I don't want to say it's non-existent, but if it was difficult before, it's almost non-existent now just because the industry doesn't exist like it used to. Exactly. Sure. And 99.99% of people getting into it, you're going to start off in a no budget field. Sure. You know, even the successful people we've seen. I, I mean, recommend you know, it. You know, Tarantino, everyone looks at him. Reservoir Dogs wasn't his first project. He he oh. started something in the 80s, uh, My Best Friend's Birthday or something, which yeah. got destroyed in a lab fire, but that was a no-budget movie. He worked at yeah. the, the film archives, raised money, bought film stock, and made his own project. And there's still no better way to sort of learn the craft. Uh, and you, you start off uh, in the book talking about limitations, uh, and that's where I think the education comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, but before you can film with those uh, limitations and learn from them, you you sort of teach the reader to start writing with those limitations in mind. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how, how do you, you know, what would you tell someone who's trying to write a movie knowing they won't have a budget to film or a very small budget? How to use available tools to build that suspense, you know, really? knowing they're not going to have like a thousand extras or, you know. Right. Oh, are we talking? Are we talking specifically building a suspense suspense scene, or just in general? Well, about it? well, I'm talking about suspense in the sense that every movie has suspense. It's what drives it forward. Even like a comedy, it's the wanting to know what happens next. That sort yeah. of that sort of drive. How do you do that? You know, well, with a a no budget film or a micro budget film, you really have to rely pretty heavily on your storytelling. That's what it is. You don't have special effects and a budget for big stunts and set pieces to distract the audience. So your storytelling has to be 110%. It's really about coming up with a rich, complex and original story that's going to keep people hanging on. And, and it really is through storytelling. Um, and in the case of my feature, stomping ground i knew that it was going to be one location six characters no special effects and so even before i sat down to write it i said there has to be a major plot point every five to seven pages so it's just before you can get too conscious of the production design the shortcomings of production values and design you have to uh, um, engineer in distractions for the audience and that's the story making something amazing happening every five to ten pages and sort of where did you look specifically when you were writing uh you have these characters every movie has characters who have sort of wants and desires uh mm -hmm. and the obstacles that come in the way where did you look for inspiration to come up with characters for what they want and what could stand in the way that didn't require necessarily a big budget Sure, sure. You know, you're first in general in this kind of film, you're going to go by and large present day realistic. You're not going to have a big budget for alien effects or spaceship effects, chase scenes, that kind of thing. So you really have to think it's, it's really about people talking to other people. Um, and we all have a story and we all have complications and roadblocks that we hit. So it's really about looking at the scenario you're working with and coming up with ways to, to manufacture it out of what you have, not what you wish you had. 
Yeah, and you also mentioned in the book uh, having uh, screenwriting hacks. To me, it mm-hmm. sounds like like Chekhov's gun, where yeah. it's it's sort of, you know, like it, it made me look at screenwriting a little differently. Where okay. it's not just sitting there with a paintbrush and and a canvas. It's more like buying a package of Legos, you know, where mm. everyone's going to have the same bricks. Everyone's going to have those same bricks. But when that. you start building it, everyone's going to build something different. A lot of them are going to look similar, but they're all going to be unique to some some extent. I love that. That's a that's a great analogy. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. What was the original question? I was, I was going to uh, say, uh, ask, I'm curious, you know, e- even with that, where do you sort of look to to keep the originality with those sort of bricks and what what what's an example of some of those those hacks or you right. know what's what's like a plot driven action something that can happen that doesn't require a plane you know crashing into sure something. you know a revelation revealing a secret you know I've been meaning to tell you this I've been a double agent this whole time um, you know I've always loved you I had no idea that kind of thing anything that can spin your plot upward into the next level of drama and complication. Um, In terms of hacks, though, uh, I just, you you brought that up. And in case I forget, I'm not sure if it will fit in. So before I forget, one of the best hacks I learned was from a producer who had optioned a screenplay of mine. And this is not, well, it's sort of a writing hack, but sort of a production hack. She said that as much as possible, limit your the population of your scenes to two people because two people you know you have master shot cut away cut away over the shoulder shot over the shoulder you know medium you know but as soon as you add a third or and then a fourth person into that scene it's just that much more coverage you have to do it takes longer it costs more so i did not have that originally in the screenplay for stomping ground so I I took that advice, applied it to Stomping Ground, and it actually really helped the story a lot better because rather than having these four people or these six people standing around and yelling at each other, you ha- I had more and more one-on-one scenes of people speaking heart to heart. And I think it actually added to the story. Yeah, I really like that uh, sort of revealing a secret because that's something that's, it's not a tangible plastic thing. Like I said, it's mm-hmm. not like, oh, a train or a bus that has to go a certain speed. But in your imagination, it can become something tangible. Like you mentioned, oh, I'm really a spy. And then from that, your imagination builds this whole other world behind the character. Right. And well, what you said there too is building the other world. Um, when you really, all you have is people talking, you really have to build a lot into what they say one of the favorite my favorite compliments that i got on stomping ground and the guy who told it to me wasn't sure it was a compliment at first we were coming out of a screening of it and he said i hope he said don't take this the wrong way but the film kind of felt like an audio book because they talk about all these different people and places that you never see. So you build them up in your head, you imagine them, and it really forces the viewer to use their imagination. And that that was partially intentional. I mean, I wasn't thinking in terms of writing an audiobook, but I was thinking of building this vibrant outside world that you never see. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever think of 12 Angry Men the same way again since you said that. Because now to me, it just sounds like an awesome podcast. Like an awesome true crime podcast series. Where, yeah, that's, that's a really good yeah. one. And hey, I love 12 Angry Men. I don't know if we talked about that the last time. No, uh, but it's it's one of those movies where, you know, it, limitations. I feel... Absolutely. If, if, you, if you're making a movie like Lawrence of Arabia and you have the budget, not, not to discredit David Lean, but you have so much more to play with where it becomes so much easier to create a beautiful shot, a beautiful sequence, distract the audience. Like you said, you have to distract the audience a little bit. Whereas it's very easy to make a a terrible movie about 12 jury members sitting in a room discussing a case. You know, 99% of those movies are going to be boring just because there's nothing to watch. There's nothing to see. There's nothing really happening. Right. So if you're able to overcome those limitations, you're able to make something far more interesting 
than sure. say Lawrence of Arabia because it sort of becomes like a magic trick. How do you make a pet rock interesting? Yeah, yeah. And ultimately, because I think we're all sort of, okay, if not voyeurs, if not anthropologists, we're all people. And I think there are a few things more interesting to us than other people. You know, I'd much rather watch a movie, uh, you know, about a woman going through the phone book. Wow, I just dated myself. Do they even have phone books anymore? But a woman doing her taxes, then, you know, okay, I, maybe maybe I wouldn't mind seeing a movie about a, a woman running away from spies or something. But, you know, we like to see other people and figure out what makes them tick. Yeah, that's something you mentioned, the phone book, uh, which is with digital technology, it becomes easier to make movies, but there's less stuff to film with the digital cameras. Whereas back in the day, you don't have a budget, but you always have a budget for a phone book. Okay, yeah. someone is looking for something. They need to go through a phone book. That right there is a plot-driven action. Yeah, exactly. Whereas now, what can you have in front of the camera? You know, what, what the, the Everything is a cell phone. A cell phone is a camera. It's a phone. It's a resource yeah. guide. And and it becomes that much more difficult, you know, to film someone uh, uh, without a budget because there's just nothing there. Even, you know, going to a pay phone is sort of non-existent. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. Just last night I was in my screenwriting group and they were reading a screenplay of mine, an older screenplay. I probably wrote this in... 2009 2010 11 and it just sat and never really went anywhere it's actually it's now being pitched to um of all places netflix india um but this was before this was just on at the beginning of smartphones and i'm reading the screenplay i'm like wow they really don't use their phones a lot in this movie you know they they actually pick up hard copies of newspapers and flip through newspapers so 1992 it's, it's very uh, yeah. and it's yeah because now it's sort of you have to have the trick to have the excuse to bring back older technology i was watching with my kids recently for the first time one of the national treasure movies mm. and he he's taking he needs to take a picture of something uh so obviously everyone has a camera in their pocket so it's easy oh, you need to take a picture you take it out right. so he had to have the excuse the phone is broken so now because the phone is broken, it's introduced to the audience. Okay, erase the modern technology. It's not there. How does he take a picture of the car, uh, of, of what he needs? He drives through a red light holding whatever it is he needs a picture of in front of the windshield. So the camera that takes a picture of the car to get the license plate has uh -huh. now taken a picture of the item he's holding in his hand. Uh -huh. See, And that's just a creative way to sort of, okay, let's find the way to disable modern technology and find a new creative way to do it. I mean, I, I immediately saw through what they were doing, but at the same sure. time, I mean, you sort of have to do something like that now. You that's, know, that's, where... that's pretty clever. Side note, a friend of mine is uh, very, very good friends with the guy who directs the National Treasure movies. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It, it's uh, um, blanking on his John name. John Turtletub. Yeah, yeah. He did um, He did Cool Runnings, too. Yep. A bunch yeah. of other stuff. Yeah, it's. I, I think they're doing another one. I yeah, mean, it was I a fun movie. It, it yeah. was a fun movie. It's okay. whenever I watch a movie like that, it's sort of you know, if you're not going to be watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, what's a Raiders of the Lost Ark type movie you can enjoy? There you go. Uh, that's true. That's that's definitely definitely the the grandchildren of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I just saw the trailer for Raiders Five for the it new one. Great. Yeah. Great. That, okay. That's a movie that's not dealing with a lot of limitations. No, Even age, age used to be a limitation. It's like, okay, know, we, we have this crazy. older star. How do we make it work? Now it's, let's just de-age them. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I just, I can't think of anything that can't be done on screen now. And yet movies have never been more boring. Yeah, you know, That's the thing, limitations. You, you mentioned the Orson Welles quote where sure. the worst thing to an artist is a lack of limitations. Yeah. And because of the digital revolution and everything that can be done, people aren't forced to get creative to work around limitations exactly, anymore. Exactly. And I, I love that. And I, I love the limitations. And I love people um, working with very little and coming up with so much. And I guess I always 
it, it kind of comes back I, as a non-musician i refer to music a lot and you know musical um compositions and and that kind of thing you know one of my favorite bands growing up was the police you know it's three people making all that that noise um it was it was great and i know you know in music production recording there there are less limitate limitations because of overdubbing of studio tricks but still it's just three people yeah and and they enjoyed it you know that that's the thing it wasn't just uh oh whatever we can imagine we can bring to the screen right filmmaking is a collaborative art form as is music to some degree not even members of the band there's the engineer the producer uh right. the label who decides what they want to put out or not and the ability for a person to just say, well, this is my entire imagination. Let's go and CGI or do this or that or just paint it on the screen. Yeah. And there's not really that other voice there that's sort of saying, well, I can't do this. Maybe we should try this, you mm -hmm. know, and, and a collection of ideas. Uh, there is something I want to talk about in your book that I found very interesting because I, I think we're on the same page. Me and you have the same sort of style we go into screenwriting. Sure. And that's... Uh, you're not writing a novel. Whatever you're writing is writing for the screen. Yeah. So whereas in the novel, you can write people's internal monologues and describe people's emotions. Mm -hmm. With a screenplay, if if you're not showing it, the audience will never know. So yeah. as an example, you know, a character walks into a room, he's angry. How's the audience supposed to know he's angry? You know, mm -hmm. You can write, he walks into a room, picks up a plate and throws it against the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's that sort of tangible, uh, uh, that action, plot driven action that shows what's happening. And you were judging a screenplay competition and you described getting a script that did the opposite. You know, it, it, it was written in fragments. They were sort of pretty much writing it like a novel, describing emotions and this and that. And you hated that they were doing that, but at the same time, loved the screenplay so yeah. much yeah. You you pushed for it to win. It ended up winning. Yeah. What was that sort of experience like where, you know, something goes against everything you teach, but it works, which is the purest definition of art, you know? Well, you know what? It really threw me. And I actually, I contacted um, my Yoda, my, my sort of master, the, the guy who I learned everything from. And um, I said, what is this? How does this work? It's not even proper English. And and he said, you know what, as long as you are expressing what the audience is supposed to feel, the actual mechanics and grammar doesn't matter. Um, now, a lot of people take that too far and they write these really long winded, bloated screenplays that are full of internal action. So I, w I, I don't want to see screenplays written like novels, but... You know, so, so this screenplay that I read last night at my screenwriting group, I had gone through it and done another draft of it um, since the last one in 2010. And I added a bunch of stuff like that. I added some, like, he doesn't know what to do, which originally I would have never written something like that. But it's it's really about getting the feeling across yeah, there's a story where Harvey Keitel talks about when he first got the script for Bad Lieutenant, mm -hmm. and it was like 50 pages, but it was written in like size 20, triple spaced. He's like, what the hell is this? It was just like ramblings. But that movie, you know, is still talked about today. It's still oh, sure. you know, it's yeah. in insanely influential. Oh, and yeah. it's sort of, you, you know, how much is the structure, the plot, the that of the screenplay versus really identifying interesting characters and in an interesting situation that with the right actors lends itself to be, you know, developed into an interesting story. Yeah, sure. And there's just so many different ways to tell a story. In fact, I was, I was having a really interesting uh, conversation last night with the guy from my screenwriting group. Um, and he's also now a screenwriting professor with me at Drexel. And he says he doesn't think in terms of three act structure. He thinks of interesting characters in interesting situations. Oh, and just as a side note, this guy did DVD special features. That was his, he made DVD. His job was making DVD special features for like 30 years and trailers. 
Like he he did the trailer for Titanic. So film yeah. school. He made film school for all of us. Which yeah, is, exactly. You know, all those special features. It's it's you know very inexpensive film school. Todd uh, Field, uh, writer director Todd Field mm-hmm. says that he learned everything he needed to know about filmmaking from the DVD commentary mm-hmm. on Taxi Driver. Yeah, one of the greatest DVD commentaries is for Chinatown with David oh, Fincher. Okay. Oh really? Uh, yeah, David Fincher is on it with Robert Town, the the screenwriter of Chinatown. Oh, now that and I, I remember the first time I listened to it, I didn't even watch the movie. I just had the audio commentary on, and I knew the movie by heart, so, you know, so well that I knew it by heart. And it was so interesting because it wasn't just the people who made the movie; it was another filmmaker at that moment, not being a filmmaker, being the fanboy, the the mm-hmm. you know the person so obsessed with movies that he eventually became a filmmaker, yeah. talking with the the. Uh, the writer of the movie and asking him these questions that we would ask if we were sitting down with him about his movies, asking how much of this was you, how much of this was Roman Mm -hmm. Polanski. Was that something you found on set or was that something that you originally planned into? And it was super fascinating. And, you know, not just by listening about how the movie was made, but the types of questions a master director in his own right asks you realize what approach he has when he goes into making a movie, how much Mm -hmm. he wants to be prepared from the screen screenplay phase uh, to oh, sort yeah. of know, okay, when we're going to the movie, it's like Hitchcock said, my movie's done. All I need to do is is go film it. Right, which he found incredibly tedious and boring. Yeah. He really did not like production, but I get that. I kind of like production. Um, it had been a long, long time since I was on set. Like, you know, I made movies. I, I worked on some movies when I was a kid, you know, like 22, 23. And I did a couple other things but then i didn't do another i was not on another film set uh until 2013 when i shot stomping ground and uh, or i had done i I guess i shot a pilot right before for some i got hired to direct a pilot right before stomping ground it's it's kind of boring being on set Uh, so i get that um i like being on set but you know if we could just like have six hour days instead of 12 hour days yeah, but here, here's the thing about being on set. It's 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 very tedious, but there's two moments that, for me, are, are just the greatest moments, and you can't get that from post production or pre production. It's all mm-hmm. it only happens on set. That's a the camaraderie, the fact with you with other people, who sort of, you know, the rest of the world shuns and makes fun of. You know, we're we're right. adults who want. I was watching uh uh. Finding Neverland with Johnny Depp, where they're talking about what's a play. Why is it called a play? Because mm-hmm. you're playing, you know, you're mm-hmm. letting your, your inner child out. Don't take it too seriously. You're adults putting on costumes and and doing all this stuff. And you get to share that with other people who understand what it is. There's like no sure. share. It's like is, a great after school club. You know, yeah, there there is a um an element of that. Uh, back to music. Um earlier this year over the summer, I think I watched a documentary about the singer Pink who I actually really mm-hmm. like. Um, but she talks about, you know, her band of dancers and musicians. And she said, there, we're all just people who just don't fit into regular society. It's we've all run off to join the circus mm-hmm. and not live. You know, we might live, you know, 12 to 12 lives. You, may, you might work from 12 in the afternoon to till midnight, but it beats going to a cubicle every day which is not to denigrate anybody listening who might go to a cubicle every day because those people make the world run but there's some people who just don't thrive in that dynamic yeah it's the artist dream the the end of (laughs) ivitaloni which fellini sort of made about himself before eight and a half his uh, one one of his first movies where at the end the character that represents him just sort of gets on a train and leaves to go be an artist and you sort of want to just break away from this accepted world and live in a fantasy world which is play yeah Uh, the the other moment on set is and this is something you mentioned in your in your book uh uh, something that paul schrader says uh who you mentioned taxi driver he wrote taxi driver amongst other great movies great director in his own right yeah Uh, he says a screenplay isn't yeah yeah Oh, uh, sure, dude, but I'll, I'll, or do you want me to? Do, I don't even want to interrupt you. No, no, yeah, yeah, go on to that. I want to. So hear I was, I was, teaching, I was teaching um, film history at Drexel, 
And um, Paul Schrader, they had gotten Paul Schrader to come in for a few days as an artist in residence. So he spent two or three days on campus going around to different classes, having special lectures and screenings. And they asked me, even though my class was American classic cinema, where I was showing films from the uh, 30s through the 50s, they said, hey, do you think you could have a screening of Taxi Driver since we have Paul Schrader? I'm like, Taxi Driver is easily top 10, top five favorite movies of mine. So to have Paul Schrader there for a screening of Taxi Driver, um, he's still at the top of his game too. I think he's still really doing some good work. But um, after the screening of Taxi Driver, he came up to me and it was like he had seen a ghost. He was really shaken. He said, I haven't seen that for a long time. They see that it really took him back to a very dark place. I, and if I can, it can do that to the the guy who wrote it. Imagine yeah. what it did for the rest of us. Well, that the movie was exercising demon. Any script is you 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 know you feel so inspired. You have to get this story out. But yeah. what he said is, and you write about this in your book, is the screenplay isn't the art. It's not like yeah. a novel. The screenplay isn't the art. Screenplay Absolutely. is something that's supposed to inspire the artist to go and create the art. Yeah, And that's the interesting thing where you can write the screenplay and ultimately you didn't create anything finished, right? You're still in the brainstorming, you know, blueprint phase. Blueprint, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, until screenplay. someone makes that movie, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's not a piece of art. A screenplay uh, is sheet music. Yeah. You yeah. Beethoven wrote all his symphonies and everything, but we don't, when we, when we go to the orchestra, we don't read sheet music. We watch musicians reading sheet music and using their hands to to play the notes. That's the art. Yeah, and I think ultimately what your book is about is when you start writing the screenplay, when you, you decide, okay, this is the idea, this is what I'm going to write, don't write it with the idea that what you're writing is the final piece of art. Write it with the idea <laughs> sure. that... <clears throat> Yeah. This is an art until it's made. How can you write it for it to be successfully made? Right. Or or made, period. For instance, back yes. to the screenplay that I had written last that I had read last night. We did a reading of it last night. Um there reading it, there were some things that made me cringe. And it was all stuff that the other writer had insisted that I put in. Um, and at the end of the reading, I said, you know, it is what it is. It's out of my hands now. Um, I think Netflix India is going to produce it. And the first thing they're probably going to do is hire another writer to rewrite it. And I'll have no say in what happens and it'll come out and my name will be on it, which has happened before. Um, one of the first screenplays I ever got paid to write, um, I, I turned it on, you know, I, I wrote it and then it was a couple of years before I saw it. And I was like, what is this? I don't remember this scene. I don't remember this character. And it had been so, and the weird thing now is the tables have turned. When I, I produced a film last year and we had gotten a script that we liked. We asked the writer to do, um, rewrites he did eight drafts of it we still weren't happy so one of the other producers took a crack at it and did a rewrite and still at the you know almost this the last day the second to last day of shooting the director comes down for for the our morning meeting before shooting that day and says to me and the other producer hey can you guys write a new ending <laughs> we just changed it in the middle of production which is not uncommon. Yeah. And again, it goes back to until it's filmed and put out, it's not finished, you know? Yeah, so exactly. Right. There, people say there's the script you write, there's the script you shoot, there's the script you um, edit. And then uh, a, a, a young woman who I know, I know who uh, has done a couple films that I liked um, said, then there's also this, the script you market. Yeah. 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 It's like, you can make a product, but once the store, you know, once Walmart picks it up, they're going to decide what packaging, what this, what that to put on it. Exactly. Yeah, it's funny because I only recently uh, saw the box art for Stomping Ground, 
I call it box art. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think it's on DVD, but I saw what the distributor came up with for stomping ground. And I was like, well, it's not what I would have done, but you know, who am I to tell them their business? They're like, who asked you? Yeah, exactly. It's like, what, what are you the writer? What do you think you directed this or anything? Dave, thank you so much. Uh, oh yeah, it was a, such a pleasure. This is a lot of fun. And I, I think it's again, because you know, from my own experience, you get into movies, uh, you want to make them, but no one really teaches you how to make them with nothing. You know, yeah, it's always the so idea. I want to make good fellas, you know? Right. Here's the but, thing. All of us have nothing. I mean, yes, sure. There are some rich kids out there whose parents are like, yeah, how much is it? $10 million. Here you go, kid. Get out of my hair. You know, it's either this or rehab or something. So, <laughs> yeah. well, well that, that, that's the thing, you know, like I said, you know, we see Goodfellas, but golf, Goodfellas started with who's that knocking at my door? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's such a that's such a great um, uh, analogy or, or 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 discussion because yeah, Scorsese started with nothing, and even you know, not that big a fan. Well, I'm, I'm not a huge De Palma fan anyway, but those really really early De Palma films that he did with De Niro in the yeah. '60s are so wacky and wild and all they had was editing <laughs> film and editing and you know the no special effects but they the, the the craziness comes from from the lack of resources it's creative That's yeah the thing. so the, my mantra is um the, the the thing i want most people to learn is if you can't afford an orchestra don't write a symphony write a string quartet because you you you're somehow it might take some doing but you're going to be able to find four musicians who can sit down and play a piece for you you're not going to find 80 musicians who can play a piece for you write a string quartet and then then move on from there okay i, I think that's a good message to leave the the audience yeah, with. go find go find four friends yeah go. i know that's a that's a tricky one but you know that's what uh do they still have Craigslist? Yeah, that's what Craig, string quartet need it. So um, yeah, cool. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, always good to talk to you. And um, let's do it again.